When fresh of the production line, the British Railways D200 series were touted as the next big leap forward in Britain's railway history. We know better now, but back then in the 50s, such broad diesels were exciting. They were rated on the power scale of 1 to 5 as a Type 4, then the most powerful type to exist. However, sometimes, the D200s later to become the Class 40 were wrongly reported to be BR's first Type 4 diesels. They were not. That honour goes to the D600 series, better known as the A1A warships. The D600s were very much a product of their time. The short version of the story is that the western region of BR, the remnants of the old Great Western Railway, wanted to remain independent and so opted for diesel hydraulic power rather than the diesel electric transmission. Thing is, that's wrong. Here's the long, and as far as anyone should be concerned, accurate version of events. Diesel electric locomotives are mobile power stations. They're diesel engines power generators, which produce power which is then fed to the traction motors on the powered axles. And here Toyota are pretending to be all modern with their hybrids. The generators are heavy and, more importantly, their implementation renders some of the horsepower output of the engine itself lost to the generation of electricity. A hydraulic transmission arrangement, therefore, is lighter and leaves more horsepower to be put down at rail level. Indeed, the first diesel-electric Type 4s, the D200s, remember, were lumbering giants, slower than expected, and so heavy that they employ the same tactic of lightening the axle load that steam locomotives had used, unpowered wheel sets. The Western region thought such loss of power to weight an absolute waste, and so was invested in proving the worth of the hydraulic arrangement, as used to great success on the West German V200. Complications would materialise almost immediately though, as no British manufacturer had sufficient experience with both diesel hydraulic technology as well as the stressed skin construction of the V200s which the Western region wanted to ape. The D600s were, thusly, a compromise by the British Transport Commission between the ideas of a diesel electric and diesel hydraulic. Where the benefit of the large local construction policies of Britain's diesel electrics was taken into account when building these hydraulic machines. Two massive MAN North British engines powered the outer axles on both bogies, with the centre one just being there for support. All carrying the same bogie design as used on the LMS 10,000 and 10,001. This came together to a power output of 2,000 horsepower, with speeds of over 100 miles an hour having been recorded. When the first member of the D600 class was checked into Swindon in January 1958 after construction in Glasgow by the North British Locomotive Company, it was named Active, and so the moniker of the class was born, the Warships. D600's name was rather ironic. On her publicity run in February of the same year, one of her engines failed on the return leg of the journey to London Paddington. Now remember when I said that the loco had a power output of 2,000 horsepower? Well, the D600s had two engines. One engine could muster up 1,000 horsepower each. So when one of the engines failed, the total power left available to power the locomotive and train along was just 1,000 horsepower. This meant that whilst the outward journey had a locomotive of significant power, a Type 4 at the helm, the return journey had the same power output as a Class 20, a diesel-electric Type 1. The D600s were also at a bad place at a bad time. Not only were they a compromise made by people who frankly did not share the vision of the Western region, justifiably or otherwise, they also found themselves being quickly followed up by the Swindon Drawing Office's own design of a stressed skin Type 4, the D800, in July 1958. With just four powered axles and a weight of 80 tonnes as compared to the D600's 114 tonnes, these scaled down V200s were everything the Western region had envisioned, as well as being pretty fugly. And whilst the D800 was still not the success that the Western region had hoped for, generally being very underpowered, that did not matter. In their design, the D800s had achieved what the Western region set out to prove, 
that it had poor performance could be squeezed out of a machine which was 55 tons lighter than a GWR King class and 53 tons lighter than the D200s which themselves had appeared in March 1958. As soon as the D800s were available for service, the D600 order was curtailed at just 5 members and they were all moved off of the Prime Expresses to work the express trains west of Plymouth. The availability of the class was all over the place, mostly because the D600s would still have to be tweaked in order to get the best out of them. Although apparently Plymouth staff were very fond of the locos and were apparently not too harsh on or did not experience significant problems with the locomotive's reliability. What could without a shadow of a doubt be said about the D600s was that they were too very underpowered. An A1A wheel arrangement is perfect for more stability and riding qualities, but it leaves two dead axles on a large machine. The D600s would often struggle to get a train moving, where the steam locomotives they were intended to replace were renowned for their short-footedness. In general, the D600s were just behind the times, even before they were built. In essence, they were nothing more than a hydraulic version of the LMS 10,000 Coco diesel. Whilst great care was taken into the design of the interior of the cab, the rest of the machine just looked like an imitation of a ten-year-old design. When D600 had not even reached her 10th birthday, the class was withdrawn en masse on December 30th, 1967. None survive. Although personally, I quite like the look of them. But Western engines can't all be great. <laughs>